shared computing cluster, and uh, some of you are familiar with it, and others not. Um, my concern is that um, time is running out. It's a fairly laborious process to set up. Um, it's very fast once you do. I'm not, somebody asked this on Josh, I'm not required to use a shared computing cluster. Many of the projects I think you can do without, without it. But if you want to do something uh, a little more extensive, and if you have a, you know, an enduring interest in uh, machine learning, you might want to do it. Um, so I'll leave it up to you. Um, I'm getting some training. I'm spending time with Wenda, and I'm going to run code this week, and I'm going to get some training from the group uh, on Friday. So. I can help you with that after that. Up, up to that point, um, Wanda uses it every night. He's in his office every night running on the MPC. So he's an expert on it. So post your questions to, um, I think you're going to use it. Post your questions to Piazza. And I've asked Wanda to keep track of it for this week. Because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert. Uh, I will be on Friday night. Anyway, uh, let's see. Some homework. Last homework is out if you're doing it. Um, project milestones are coming. I'm reading through them, but I wasn't planning on doing a lot of responding unless I see an issue. If, if you don't hear from me, no news is good news. So we've already, most of us have already talked about the projects. Um, if I see any issues, I'll contact you. But otherwise, onward, onward. So. Subtitle. I don't want to give subtitles to try. I would do. Okay. So, uh, anyway, any questions about anything? Any concerns, questions? I'm happy to help you, but I don't know exactly what to do with this one. Okay, so any other concerns? Okay, so what I wanted to do for this week was talk a little bit about, um, about speech recognition, perhaps text-to-speech as well next time. And so uh, I thought I'd spend this lecture, first of all, I want to review, or just go back and add a few things to last lecture well, a week ago for our guest, and um, just talk about a uh, mixture of experts for a moment. One, one important piece that's come in for the last two versions of GPT. And then I want to talk about uh, how we do audio processing. Turns out audio processing, you just turn it into images, and you do image processing. That's kind of interesting. So we're going to talk about some of the issues in this. Okay, so today talk about audio. I'm going to give you some examples. Um, 
And uh, it's interesting because there are many things, especially in, I don't know about music, uh, sound processing in general, but if you're talking about human activities like um, jazz improvisation, melodies, uh, harmonies in music, they, they are sequential phenomena. They're not words, they're a different form. But uh, when I speak, it's, there's a sequence of sounds that comes out in time. And many of the same techniques that we have learned for uh, natural language processing can be applied to these. And so maybe I'll try to talk a little bit about that next time. I don't think I'll get to it today. Anyway, so um, just review from last time. And just to, I just want to add one important note. So I, I showed this at the end of class a week ago. GPT-3 came out in 2020. Remember this idea of this, this uh, scaling phenomena? They realized that uh, pretty much the performance of the, of the algorithms were based on their size. And this is something which has, it's sort of obvious, but there's a very, very close, I mean, they can analyze it very precisely. And so the, uh, basically from from two to three to four, it got 10 times bigger each time, roughly. And so 175 billion parameters, uh, 96 layers, 90, blah, 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 through this, and an input width of uh, 2048. That, that, that's how many tokens. That gives you not terribly much room to put in extended dialogues and so forth. Um, we'll see that that changed in GPT-4. Um, the standard stuff that we talked about, it turned out I looked at, um, I looked at some more details on this, and when they did this, like 95% of the training took place on web scrapes. Not Wikipedia, well, maybe that was part of the crawl, not necessarily books, so it's sort of interesting that they, they went for volume, not quality. But um, in any case, um, something that has been around for a while, 20 or 30 years, if, if not longer, is, is it has a variety of names. Uh, sometimes it's called ensemble learning. Uh, more recently, it's been called mixture of experts. And it was introduced in AI maybe 30 years ago, 1990, somewhere around that. Um, and not, not in the context of neural networks. But the idea is, well, in, in the case of neural in networks, um, this is a kind of, of module, it's a perfectly natural idea, a perfectly natural idea. Um, think about early software systems were you know, huge long programs, and we had languages like C and Fortran that weren't capable of doing much in terms of modularity. And then as time went on, languages were developed, uh, culminating in object-oriented languages, which is kind of an apogee of this phenomenon, where you're building distinct modules, and you're linking them together with interfaces. And that, that was a, you know, revolutionized software engineering. It was a significant factor in scaling up software systems. Well, the same exact thing happens in networks and in AI systems. So the idea is, and you can relate it to um, things that happen in AI multi-agent uh, systems and so forth, but in any case, in the, in the case of networks, it's, uh, it looks like this. You train a series of different networks. They may have the same design, but they're trained on completely different uh, data sets. So uh, this might, I'll show you on the next slide, this might be different languages, or there might be different modalities, video, so forth. And, um, and so these are trained separately, and then they are put together. So it's, it's a variety of 
transfer learning. But instead of training a foundation model and then refining it for some particular task, it kind of does it the other way around, right? What you do is you train this expert you know, for a certain kind of image, you train this expert for a different kind of image, and you try to partition the sample space and partition the knowledge into different regions. They don't have, they don't have to be completely orthogonal. And these are trained separately. And then the input comes in. And there's a bunch of different flavors of this. But the input comes in, and, and let's say in one version, it goes to all of the experts. Okay. In this case, there's no routing that takes place here. Just the input goes to all of the experts. They do their work in parallel, of course. And then they have these outputs. Then these are aggregated, this same thing we've seen over and over and over, where these can be aggregated either by concatenation or, surprisingly, by summing them together. And uh, there's a gating network, which also has access to all of the input. And it learns what, which of these to emphasize. It may take just one of them. Say this is, uh, uh, a, you know, this could be uh, something like a, a language translator. So um, if you have text, say the UN or something, and multiple documents, or a document that has uh, phrases in various languages. Uh, if you're reading certain kinds of uh, text, uh, scholarly text, it will mix different languages. Um, and so the, the ensemble output here is going to be selected from either English, you know, Arabic, English, Chinese, German, whatever. And the gating network will figure out which one of these should be used. Um, or it might be, it might be uh, multimodal. In this case, fairly easy to see. There's probably a very simple routing system here. If, if there's an image, as you did before, you give it an image and you also uh, have text. The image will go here, the text will go here, and so forth. The text will go there. And then the gating network will put this together. Now, um, this can be any number of experts. They can overlap. They can be general. It's really hard to say what they might be. I've, I've been, uh, there, there isn't a lot of information about what GP, OpenAI has done. But these could be um, ones where one of these is selected. Uh, or all of them work on it, and the results are consolidated. Sometimes it's done for efficiency, only a certain number of them are run. But the general idea is pretty clear, that you're going to have some kind of routing mechanism that's going to get your input and send it to different subcomponents, which are then, this, this is a, a, I wouldn't call it transfer learning, but these are pre-trained, and then these are all trained together so that this can select the results, or combine them in whatever way. So people have studied all sorts of ways of combining these, uh, using things called Gaussian mixture models, how to combine these in ways to give you the best aggregated output. So in a, um, and give these two examples, but they don't have to be this specific. And I don't have a lot of information. There isn't a lot of information out there what they do in GPT but they may not be exactly divided so, you know, separately into different domains. They might all work on the same. One, for text, one might be something that can recognize sentiment, and another one can recognize correctness, and another one focuses on whether it's correct English and so forth. So these can all add to the same output. Now, um, <laughs> it gets even more complicated in the transformers because typically only some layers, you know, 26 layers, not all of them have experts, but typically in the earlier layers, I'm guessing, you will have mixtures of experts. There might be some 
number of these. Um, and then the experts, think of a bunch of people in a room, experts in a room consulting, right? And they can talk to each other. So uh, as usual in these situations, you can't just connect everything up to everything else and hope for the best. It won't train. It, won't, it will take too long. So they found some way to, uh, to have these experts communicate with each other in the same layers. And again, information is lacking on what GPT does. But bless you. Um, you know, in the midst of, you know, in the midst of this multi-headed attention and, and all the different things that are happening, these are communicating with each other. And there's numbers of these, so it's a really interesting, but a, I, I think a perfectly natural idea. If you think about, you know, the progress of software engineering, it's sort of natural that modularity will happen. Uh, you will see. You already will see. Um, these systems are going to interact with non-network components. Uh, it's been a robot. It will interact with actuators and so forth, and speakers and microphones. And so this is perfectly natural development. So GPT-4, which was introduced this year, uh, one of the big claims for it is it's multimodal. There are 16, let's see, uh, 16 different experts. Surely some of them are devoted to the multimodal part. Uh, it also handles 26 languages, so it doesn't have a separate expert for each language. Um, but 16 different experts, and I don't know how many layers, I couldn't find out. Uh, I mean, how many layers had mix of experts? 120 layers and 1.8 trillion parameters. Just enormous. Uh, but the mixture of experts is something you're going to see more and more of. Um, the really fascinating thing about GPT-4 is look at the input, the context side. They've changed this. To, I think we talked about this, uh, James, I think, asked what we were talking about this. Um, the notion of attention with this multi-headed attention, the main problem with the input size is not, not adding more width to the layers. That's cheap. The multi-headed attention is a quadratic, the naive version is a quadratic algorithm. Think of it as, you know, every token, you have tokens like this, every one of them has to communicate with every other one. So now it's a square, right? Everyone communicates. You have to figure out every other token's relationship with every other one. So it's a quadratic. So as the as the context size, as the input size gets bigger and bigger becomes less and less and less and less efficient. Longer and longer the train. So, and I, again, I mentioned this a week or so ago, um, they found out different ways to um, do probabilistic versions of attention, uh, mixtures of different simple ways of, of doing attention that don't require the entire n squared number of connections. And based on that, now the input length is 32K, 32K. So you can put enormously long documents into, into um, uh, GPT-4. I don't know how images work in this notion of input. Presumably this is one of the reasons why it's so large, but I don't know what they're calling a token. I don't know, I couldn't find out. There isn't a lot of information about it, but you're gonna see more and more of this. Uh, and the next iteration will be out in the spring. So, fascinating, fascinating. Okay, so let's make a switch. Um, talk about all you. So sound is produced by vibrating objects which create pressure waves in the air. So when I clap, there's a little vibration in my hands. Uh, air travels about 768 miles an hour, a mile in about four and a half seconds. And they're sensed by your eardrum, turned into neural signals. These are 
Chris, uh, there's some nice, there's all kinds of cool stuff on YouTube that shows sound. Um, th these are the sound waves coming out from the clap, which looks like heat. Um, but the, the, the thing to remember about sound, a couple of things to remember, when you clap or when I make sounds or any kind of, any kind of sound, what it is basically doing is compressing the wave, sound waves together. And just like in a room, if you have a, a bunch of people, if I sort of move over and bump somebody, they'll move over and they'll, and everybody will bump into everybody and you can sort of these sort of waves can propagate through groups of people and think of the wave in a football stadium or something. And so these compression waves go out in a sphere in three dimensions, of course, from the source. And these longitudinal waves, they're not waves that go back and forth like this, uh, but compression waves like this as, as they hit your ear. And so here, the, the pressure, the air pressure is higher. The atoms are closer together. The molecules are closer together. Here, they're further apart. Close together, further apart. And the way that we represent this in mathematics and signal processing and for audio processing, um, you represent it on a scale with two, two parameters, two. Time, it's a time sequence, and then the only other parameter is pressure. That's it. And this right there, that, that statement, that it is a time series of one parameter, pressure. And this is why audio is so difficult. Okay. Unlike the visual cortex, you have, you know, light uh, has different frequencies and intensities. Essentially, this is like light, but without any frequency. <laughs> it's, it's one color. So, you only have one parameter that's varying through time. This would be the atmospheric pressure at this point in time. And these happen very quickly, very fast, because of the, the nature of the physical media, the basic idea is a sine wave. Sine wave, cosine wave, similar. And so a very simple oscillation, the simplest possible oscillation Okay, a very sharp slap, a target gun or something like that, is, uh, is a sine wave. Now just some basic, basic ideas, I'm not going to go into these in great detail. The wavelength, the distance between the two, because it's traveling at a constant speed. Well, in air, it travels faster in denser materials, it travels faster in water, faster still here as the as the um, uh, pressure gets less, uh, travels more and more slowly. But the wavelength is then related to the period, the time between these peaks. And that's inversely related to the frequency. So the two things that we really want to think about, and that we're going to think about going forward as we think about how to process sound, is the frequency and the amplitude. So the inverse of the period essentially is the frequency. The number of times the wave hits a peak in a second. Think of standing in the ocean, waves are coming through regularly. The amount of time between each time the wave hits, top of the wave hits your stomach is the period. The number of such hits in a second is the frequency measured in hertz. Hertz due to Mr. Hertz, um, 200 years ago, uh, is one oscillation per second. Because of the range of frequencies that our ear responds to as humans, it's typically measured in kilohertz, a thousand oscillations per second. So the other thing is the amplitude, and that is not exactly the loudness, we'll talk about that in a second, but the the distance from sea level pressure to the pressure of that wave. Let's 
Let's not get caught up in the physical properties too much. Now, one of the immensely difficult things about processing sound is uh, called psych it's your, your psychoacoustical principles. Almost nothing of what we do as humans is literally interpreted. Almost nothing of what we perceive is literally true in the environment. You can think about light. You know, if you've seen, you know, infrared or you know various views of the galaxies or sun or stars or just a room where if you're looking at infrared, you can see heat signatures. You're sensing at different frequencies. And so, for example, insects may be able to see in certain ranges they can detect heat. Right? Uh, same thing with sound. Humans uh, can detect sounds from about 20 hertz. The lowest note on the piano in A is 16 hertz. It just sounds like a bump. It hardly sounds like anything. And the highest notes on the piano are around uh, 12 kilohertz, but we can hear up to about 20 kilohertz. Well, you can. As we get older, and as you ride on the red line more and more, and go into more and more rock concerts and play music through your headphones loud, <laughs> you damage your hearing, and uh, so you can hear less and less uh, uh, high, uh, high frequencies. So, um, but humans roughly can hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Dogs can hear much higher, about twice as high. Cats, twice as high again. Bats can hear up to 200 kilohertz. They can hear from 1 hertz to 200 <coughs> kilohertz. Bats mostly, mostly sense the environment through hearing, right? And they, so they can hunt at night. So they have an enormous range. So beneath this, you won't, you just won't hear it. Above this here, you just won't hear it. It's like, you ever, you've seen those dog whistles? You know, you can blow them, you don't hear them. But the dog can hear it. <laughs> Never seen a cat whistle, they wouldn't come anyway. So, but it gets even more complicated than just that we can hear within certain ranges. So here is a logarithmic scale from 10, from about 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz, logarithmic scale. Um, I don't know how many people have had their hearing tested but I get it tested once a year or so, and it's getting worse and worse. Why well, keep going like this when you're talking? Um, but we do not hear, we, nobody, even with perfect hearing, does not hear all sounds at the same amplitude level. It depends on the frequency. All these complicated things that go on. First of all, um, we hear things on a logarithmic scale. Um, so basically, it, and it's so hard to do this, and I've done this in class over and over, it never corresponds to the theory, the theory, but for something to be twice as loud, okay, you hear, when you double the power, okay, of a signal, then it sounds twice as loud. You hear in a logarithmic sense, okay, you hear in the sense that from 10 to, well, this is in a logarithmic scale already, but when you, you'll hear as you get to make something twice as powerful and twice, 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 you will hear it going up in a kind of linear sense. This is getting louder and louder in a linear sense. Or if you take a volume knob and you turn it, what it's really doing, okay, it is, it is doubling every, you know, every increment you turn that volume knob, it is getting a percentage bigger. You might be doubling, 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 because that's how we hear sound. It's logarithmic. Our perceptions are almost all, at least in sound, logarithmic in nature. So uh, sound pressure levels are measured in decibels, which is a logarithmic scale. That's all we need to know. That's one thing. And then, then it's even worse because we don't hear all frequencies at the same, the same acuity. So um, here is uh, at, at say a thousand hertz.
words, which is, you know, maybe just high G or something on the piano, just sort of in the treble plus. Um, you hear some sound, but as the sound gets lower, you are less and less sensitive. This is called the, these are thresholds of hearing. So for a healthy person, this is your threshold of hearing, meaning at a thousand hertz, below this number of decibels, you won't hear it. Okay, but now let's go up to, let's go here to 100 hertz, so in the bass clef. Uh, here, you would need it to be louder just to even hear it. So down here, if you have a certain power, certain amplitude, if, if it's at a higher frequency, you'll hear it. It's above the threshold, but here you won't. You won't hear it. And so our acuity to sounds depends on the frequency, and it follows this bizarre uh, curve. And it's a really interesting thing. Uh, there's this dip right here. <coughs> right here, and um, it's very curious because there are a lot of very strange things that happen in our auditory apparatus, and one of them is right here. This is the resonant frequency of the ear canal. The ear canal is like this, right? And when you have a resonance chamber, you um, think of playing a flute or something, you disturb the air, but it, it, it resonates. It has this feedback mechanism, and it amplifies, essentially. It can collect sound and, and essentially amplify over time. That's what happens here. You don't need to hear sounds in this range. You don't need as much sound coming in because your ear canal has a resonance. It's an open, open tube, and it will, in some sense, amplify. So it's very curious. There's a lot of strange things that you can see that throughout. So there's a lot of strange things that happen when we uh, when we try to actually figure out how. Okay. Working good. Um, oh, starting something. Oh, I didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, I already told you. <laughs> Loudness is logarithm. So, here's the other thing. Okay, so that's sound, analog sound. Um, sound is sampled. Sound in, for computer analysis, for any kind of storage of sound in an electronic device, um, it can be stored in an analog fashion on a tape, on a record, a uh, long playing disc. Um, but the more typical thing, and especially for analysis by neural networks, deep learning, uh, it's stored as samples. So for example, um, CD quality sound uh, is, uh, typically stored, uh, the wave files, the sort of simplest way of storing it is, you store them as 16-bit integers, and you sample 44,100 times a second. This is just a little bit more than twice our ability, our, our range of hearing for technical reasons, but uh, basically what you're going to do is this is a one, this is a time series with one parameter. The only thing it's measuring is the loudness or the amplitude. And so you're going to take, you could essentially take measurements of the sound pressure level 44,100 times a second. And you record that from the maximum to the minimum in a 16-bit integer. Many other ways of, are possible. There's uh, uh, different, you can use floating point, you can use a higher or lower sample rate. MP3s work on a very different idea. They, they store it in a sort of perceptual encoding. But if we just think about the simplest thing, the simplest way of looking at an audio file, it's something like 
a 16 bit integer, 44,100 times a second. And that is it. That is the signal. And so, um, and it, there's, there are errors in both dimensions, right? So you can have errors in the time dimension, obviously because of rounding. You can have errors in the level. And all of these introduce distortion or noise or loss of quality. So any signal can basically be broken down into individual samples. So fast you can't hear them, right? But this is obviously, well, this, I don't know what this is. Might be sound, might be an instrument, it might be voice. But when you, when you really dig into it, it's individual samples which are stored in a one-dimensional vector. So that's how sound is presented to a machine. It's a vector of integers. And neural networks love vectors, don't they? <laughs> so it works pretty well. Okay. People have tried to do um, uh, audio processing just on the original signals. So uh, one second, 44,100 integers. Uh, you can actually take that and process it with a, with a neural network. Um, and some interesting things happen. But the most common approach, um, and that, that seemed to hold promise, but uh, I don't think it panned out the way people wanted to. Um, the more usual thing is to pre-process the sound in a way that uh, forms the basis for machine learning of sound. And it's based on something called the Fourier transform. Mr. Fourier uh, was a mathematician. He actually was studying, he uh, worked for Napoleon. He worked, he was in the Napoleon, the French government, he traveled to Egypt with him. And he was a mathematician, did various kinds of things. But one of the things that he was interested in is, uh, he, everybody was interested in, in making uh, steam engines more efficient. And, uh, now we try to make neural networks more efficient. Back then it was steam engines. Time goes on. But everyone wanted to understand how heat transferred in engines and how to make them more efficient. So he realized that as he studied heat, which occurs in waves that are essentially similar to sound, that he came up with this mathematical result. His mathematical result is that any um, any periodic, any periodic uh, sound, so music, voice, they're periodic. They're periodic in general. Um, the the um, idea of the period, right? Well, this is a very simple one, but if you combine lots and lots of different waves together, I'll show you. You get periodic sounds that have a pitch. And the various instruments you're playing at a certain frequency, it's going to have a period that repeats at that frequency. So here's a periodic wave. It repeats in this period. Any place, if I'm holding my fingers you know, a period apart, I'm in the same part of the wave that go forward. So it just repeats. Now, sound isn't perfectly periodic. It changes, but much of it is periodic, and that's what sound processing tries to uncover. And so what you can do is discover that you can add together, you can add together simple sine waves in what's called a harmonic series, uh, and any periodic wave can be composed of a bunch of simpler sine waves. So basically, this is called additive synthesis if you do it deliberately. Uh, it's called Fourier analysis if you break it apart. But basically, here are uh, here's a sine wave. 
right, so there's the period. Here's one that's, uh, uh, so it's two pi, so it's, it's let's just say, a <laughs> shorter period, shorter still, shorter still. Um, you can make more complex sounds by adding together just sine waves of various frequencies and phases. Phases is where it's shifted. They don't always, these all start at zero. But sound waves don't always do that. So by adding together a bunch of simple sine waves, you can make any sound that has a pitch. Now, I came in here last night and played around with this for half an hour. Could not get the audio to work. I'll ask them to uh, come and uh, try to fix that. But here's an example, and I, I can play it on this machine. It may not be very loud. But for example, uh, we have these smooth waves. And it seems impossible, but if you add together enough of these waves, you can get what's called a square wave with sharp corners. And it seems impossible, but as you add them together, they get closer and closer and closer to a square wave. Now what I'm going to play for you is a signal which starts with one wave, and I don't know how long it is to see, but every tenth of a second or something, I don't know, maybe every second, they add another, what's called a harmonic, they add another wave. And they keep adding more and more waves, and it changes the character of the waves. So just see if you can hear this. I don't know how well you'll be able to hear it. Every second, one is added, but after a while, you don't. Let's try it again. And what you're getting is adding more and more high frequency waves at certain amplitudes and phases. And finally, you get that a square wave sound that guitarists love. Created out of combinations of sine waves. If you think of it like a guitar uh, string, if you talk a guitar string, you're, you're, you're setting in motion the string, but eventually the resonance of the string stabilizes so that you have certain vibration modes. It's either vibrating like this or like this. Let me see if I can do it. I can't do the three. <laughs> but it's vibrating in, certain, in, in a series of modes, and that's what gives the guitar its characteristic sound. Every instrument has a characteristic sound. Every voice has a characteristic sound. Why does one sound, a, a pitch sound, why is it different from another pitch sound, another instrument? It's because of the components that are added together. What that means is that you can represent a sound wave in two distinct ways, and you can transform between them losslessly up to the digital representation. Okay, accuracy. So here is uh, the amplitude versus time. Right? But if I were to use what's called the Fourier transform, which was uh, described by Mr. Fourier, but wasn't really practical until a fast version, a recursive version, was invented in the 1950s called the fast Fourier transform, the FFT. You may have seen that. It's been called the most important algorithm of all time. I don't know. But, um, what the FFT does is it takes a series of measurements like this, there's a sample rate, and it converts it into 
a list of the frequencies that make up that sound. In other words, I can represent a musical signal by listing all the samples over some period of time. So this is a two-second signal. I would list this in an array with 88,216-bit numbers in it. And that would give me the signal. I could play it. You heard something. This is a square wave. You just heard. Or, or, you can give me the frequency and the amplitude and the phase of a discrete set of components, and it will be the exact same thing. In other words, because you can always decompose a sound into square waves, there's two representations for a sound, for an audio signal, no matter how long. There's the time domain, where you're speaking of time <coughs> and you know, the measurements, or the frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, you have frequency versus amplitude. In other words, this is amplitude over time. This is amplitude over frequency. And they're equivalent, which is shocking, <laughs> which is amazing. And so if you want to represent this signal, you can just have a list of all of the components that make up the signal. It's lossless. You can go back and forth between the two, but no loss, none whatsoever, up to machine accuracy. And this is the key to processing. No, no, no. No, that's not what I want. So, the, um, you can take a signal and using the FFT, the fast forward a transform, you can analyze it into what's called a spectrum. And the spectrum is a list of frequencies uh, and their amplitude. And then there's, a, uh, there's an inverse version of it, which just reverses everything that does, which can take a spectrum and turn it into an audio signal. Okay? So you have two different ways of viewing a signal through time. Time being the constant parameter here, you know, time being sort of fundamental. fundamental. Um, you can take the time domain, and uh, they call it time domain, even though time is in both of them. Um, and you take the amplitude, well, I guess because the thing that changes here is time versus frequency. Okay, time domain, amplitude staying the same. Uh, amplitude over time. Or you can turn it around and look at it from another point of view and you see it in the frequency domain and it's frequency versus amplitude. And there's tremendous applications of this throughout mathematics. It's been around for hundreds of years. Now, Another aspect of this is that actually what Fourier showed is that you can create these uh, signals out of what's called the harmonic series. And so basically if you take some fundamental, what is this, 440? I don't know. Yeah, 440. 440. Um, what is this, clarinet? Clarinet. A clarinet playing at 440 hertz, A440, 440. Again, you can't hear this too well. Okay, that's a clarinet. Why does that sound different than a piano? Oh, what's that sound different than my lovely singing voice? Why does it sound different? If you look at the signal, you can see that it's periodic. See this little peak? peaks up here, two little peaks. This is the characteristic sound of a, of a clarinet. And if you look at the spectrum uh, at a particular point uh, of this signal, 
you'll see that it has a fundamental, which is par 40, the sort of lowest, loudest note, the sine wave that's sort of the lowest, typically lowest and the loudest, okay? And then as you go up the harmonic scale, you, it basically because of the characteristic of an open pipe, a clarinet has a reed at one end and it's open at the other end, and a half open pipe, what it does is it emphasizes the odd harmonic, first, third, fifth, not exactly, but you can see that it has different peaks here, and that corresponds to the sound of the clarinet. And you can imitate a clarinet electronically by creating these sine waves and adding them together, and it sounds pretty close to a clarinet. So a spectrum is a slice in a very short period of time. It's not instantaneous, because instantaneously you just have one sample. Right? There's no sense in which we can say instantaneously looking at this array, you have all this information. Instantaneously, it's one, one sample. But over a short window, a short enough window to capture the periodicity here, you can detect the different sine waves that make up that sound. And let's just say it's in some sense instantaneous. So, one more step. How do I account for the fact that over time that signal changes? The timbre is going to change a little bit, uh, the loudness will change, the musician can introduce various changes to the frequency. What do we do to account for time and not sort of an instantaneous view? Here's what you do. <laughs> You take some number of samples, typically um, 20 milliseconds, you know, 50th of a second, some very short, you know, so 50 into 22,100, uh, 4,420, no, uh, 442. 442 samples, if you want a 50th of a second, you get 400 and 42 samples, 442 samples in here, okay, to analyze, and that gives you a spectrum for the first 50th of a second, and then guess what you do, you just keep doing, <laughs> right? So. What we're going to do is take 442 samples, find the spectrum, and what is the spectrum? Remember, it is a bunch of frequencies, and the frequencies are harmonics. So you have 1, 2, 4, no, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so the frequencies increase linearly. And you'll get it from, say, 20 hertz. Well, actually, you start at zero, up to 20,000. Okay? And you will have some number of floating point numbers that tell you that tell you the amplitude of 1 hertz, 2 hertz, 3 hertz, 4 hertz, so forth. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that. Depending on the way that you take the sample width, you get certain frequencies. Um, so for one hertz, you need a one second sample window, which is too big. One fiftieth of a second, you start the lowest frequency is 50 hertz, pretty close to the bottom of the piano. And then you get 50, 100, 150, 200. You go up in a linear scale in the frequency. And so all you can measure is the frequencies, say, 50, 150, uh, 50, 100, 150, 200, 200. And you go all the way up to 20,000 in units of 50. And so then you get the amplitude for each one of those. 
and that's the spectrum. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is going to be uh, if it's fifty, if the frequencies are fifty, you're going to get fifty to say uh, twenty thousand, right? So it's going to be uh, four hundred frequencies, four hundred floating point numbers, four hundred floating point numbers. It'll represent a fiftieth of a second of music or sound, or whatever. And then you just take the next fiftieth of a second, and then the next fiftieth, and you keep doing that. And each one of them is an array, say, of four hundred floating point numbers, which are the amplitude of the frequencies. And then you take fifty of these puppies, and that's a second. So a second of music can be represented by a two-dimensional matrix with you know, columns for each little snippet, each little sample of music, one fiftieth of a second, below your ability to recognize. And then the rows are the frequency amplitudes of say 400 of them. And that can represent a second of music. Now, typically they overlap. Uh, and there's lots of complicated things that are done in calculating these, but the basic idea is to take each one of these little samples, analyze the individual ones, and, and turn them into individual spectra. And what you end up with is something like this. Um, this is a heat map of a spectrum, uh, and here's time. Here are the frequencies, 1K, 2K, 3K, 4, 5, and so forth like that. Uh, this is actually given in a logarithmic scale, uh, for reasons we'll discuss in a moment. But you can see that this is, these are the harmonics. And there's one at every, you know, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, and so forth. And every, every sound can be represented that way. So, here is a, uh, let me see if I can do this. I don't know, I did this earlier. So. This is Adobe Audition, and uh, it's free for BU students and professors and so forth. Uh, here is, oh, let me zoom out. Here is a signal that I created. I, again, my apologies, I'm not sure how well you can hear this. Um, here's the signal. Okay, this is a recording of my voice for CS505. Now, this is in stereo. Okay, this is a and um, here is just me saying A, A. two things. A, 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 right? You hear the A here. Can, um, this is the time domain representation. You can see uh, the amplitude if we dig into this. Uh, see the individual samples. Not yet. <laughs> 
you know, they're the individual samples. So that's time domain. Um, and then here is the That is, this is the spectrogram. Okay, let's listen to it if we can. Uh, oh, it just focused on that one thing. Okay, this is a recording of my voice for CS505. So this okay, is. Okay, this is a. Recording of my voice for CS505. 505. Good. So the this is a heat map. So the brightest colors are the loudest. You can see that this is the this is the predominant 505. Ah, whatever pitch that is, is somewhere, you know, in the middle of these piano keyboard. Uh, but there are Lots and lots of frequency components, which is why I don't sound like a clarinet, and why I sound different than somebody else. So, you can represent spectra in lots of different ways. You can represent them in faux 3D, uh, typically, you know, uh, the previous one with the heat map, uh, but this is a, uh, this is just black and white, and you can see what happens in the, in the, uh, this is somebody singing somewhere over the rainbow. So, the pitch here, somewhere, it went up a little bit, right? <laughs> oh, it went down, da, 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 you can kind of see the whole thing shifting up and down for the notes. You can also see the repeated structure, because that's where the harmonics are. And what is this? Any idea? Vibrato. <laughs> so you can see that this, this is, if you record the sound, or you give me the heat you give me all these numbers, it's the same exact thing in a different form. But this gives us the ability now, we've pulled it out. Essentially, we've taken it, it's still a time domain, but we've increased the dimensionality, right? Because now it's in, it's in two dimensions, right? I mean, we have time plus two more dimensions. We have frequency and amplitude. So when you look at people saying ball, bar, bow, by, there's a different shape to each one of these. And you can identify, you know, here's a predominant pitch. You can get the pitch out. And there's all kinds of things you can get out of the spectrum by you know, examining them. And spectrograms are very easy to make. Uh, all Python is full of libraries for doing this. So here's, I don't know what this is, a spectrogram on, but you can just take a, you can just, uh, you can just take a signal. This X is a sequence of 44,100 per second, 16 bit integers. You feed it in, uh, you give it some parameters. Here's the sample rate, uh, I, that's another thing, <laughs> and it'll draw the spectrum. Now, let me go back to that. There's one more, there's one more thing you need to realize, though, that we hear sound in a logarithmic scale. So, if you if you hear sound getting progressively louder in, uh, in your perception, you say, "Oh yeah, it's 
it's getting louder like this in a straight line. It's actually doubling. And so we hear on a logarithmic scale, but guess what? We also perceive pitch on a logarithmic scale. So now there's three things going on here. We perceive loudness on a logarithmic scale. We perceive pitch on a logarithmic scale. And then there's that fun, you know, our sensitivity per frequency. There's a lot of things going on in cycloacoustics. So basically, experimentally, people have worked out a formula which gives our perceptual scale what you would need to represent in order to get certain frequency perceptions. And that's called the Mel scale. The Mel scale. And the Mel scale is can be used to represent the frequency. So, to conclude, um, time is pretty much fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, the amplitude, which is the brightness, the, the way the, the scale of the numbers, remember this is, uh, say, you know, however many for 10 seconds, uh, 400 and 41,000 samples. If there's 400 frequencies here, well, you've got to turn that into mel equivalents. Let's say there's still 400. You're going to have these 400 numbers. The, the frequency is given by the mel scale. The amplitude is also treated logarithmic. All these things are done for you. The Librosa power to dB does the log scale for amplitude. The mel spectrogram takes care of the other part of it. And it's quite easy using a library called Librosa. You can install it very easily. And you can convert between these two. You can take, um, you can take sounds and turn them into Mel spectrograms. So the game here is going to be identifying phonemes the smallest components of pronunciation using the smell spectrogram. So when we pronounce different, different uh, vowels, say, there's different configurations, and it will have a different spectrogram for each of the sounds. And so Basically, you can see, I mean, let's take, for example, S. The S sound is lots of high frequency disturbance as you send air out through your teeth. And look at what happens. At the high frequencies, you have a lot of intensity, right? And not so much here. All these sort of sounds with lots of disturbance, right? Not as loud. You can see that the higher frequencies are getting used, right? Um, here's puff. It's a little higher. <laughs> but, but, well, that sounds lower. But, but, but each one of these is going to have a different signature. Mm, mm, mm. And then here are, the, here are the vowels. Vowels are actually the hardest. You can imagine. It's sort of easy to tell the difference between t and mm. But vowels are harder. Uh, and they follow a certain progression as the mouth gets more and more open or closed. But they basically have this. You can see that there's not a heck of a lot of difference between some of these, right? But basically, the game here is going to be that we're going to try to identify in a sound file, identify the basic components, the phonemes, the smallest little units of pronunciation by their spectrogram. So let me show you, uh, just in a minute or two that remains, something I'll come back to next time. But. Um, uh, where is it? Oh no, oh, maybe it's not working. No, <laughs> I 
glad I ran it before. Um, so here are some, this is a uh, database of spoken digits. Now, for things like digits, it's a combination of, you know, many different phonemes. Two, <laughs> three, you know, there's different phonemes in there. Um, but here are, there's a database of, that it's on Kaggle, it's sort of familiar, it's the Hello World of audio programs, of, uh, of 50 different people speaking to 10 digits. So it's the audio equivalent of the handwritten digits database, the MNIST. Uh, so here is a audio signal from uh, Lucas, okay? Here's Theo, okay, let me go down and get some where I have the actual, oops. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Okay, here is uh, Nicholas one. saying one. One, 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 one. Okay. There's the spectrogram. <laughs> so that's what they're saying, one. Uh, and uh, you can run, uh, this I did in Keras uh, last year, but you can run basically a, a it's a CNN, a convolutional neural network, but you can treat it as a, as a recognizing a certain kind of shape in an image. And by training with straightforward, you get 93% accuracy. By identifying what the spectrograms look like for each one of the one, two, three, four, all of them, spoken by all these different people. So what we're going to do, and I'll end here, uh, what I want to do next time, I'm going to start with this, and I'm going to take you through and show you how, you know, this is a very simple example of audio processing of speech recognition. The problem, of course, will be when you have continuous sound, right? When you have continuous sound from various people and so forth, it becomes much more complicated to disambiguate. But uh, this is where we start. You turn speech, and you turn sound, audio, for music, for anything, you turn it into mel spectrograms. And now it's, a, it's an image. And now you're trying to recognize a certain kind of image. It's really quite remarkable. You should turn it into a different kind of cell. Okay, let me stop there. Next time I'll show you uh, sort of more human-related examples. Determined not to get COVID at the end of the semester. Yeah.
But now you're in real time, so it's yeah. got to be fair test. But for example, uh, score follow, I did this in my course, score follow, yeah. you can have companies that listen to a piano performance and show you where the score is. There's all sorts of things. But let's get out of that square. Oh, I'll meet you out there. Sorry to be the glue. Oh, no, no, no. <sighs> Two more lectures. Two more. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, huh? Words are the guardians of light of the house. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hang in there. Life, life has different periods. Huh? I said life has different periods for us. So some are easier than others. Some are easier than others. Oh, yeah, as as they say in a different oh, setting, it gets easier. <laughs> Eventually, it gets really easy. <laughs> yeah, oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, last time, mate, uh, did, you, did, you, did you provide me your donkey? Yeah, I okay, left it here. I also oh. left my jacket here, but I wasn't very fond of it, so it's gone. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I just wasn't sure if it was... That was I, I, okay. yeah. It was here. It was here. Okay. It was right there. No, I saw the dongle. I didn't notice yeah. the jacket. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, yeah. I so our faculty are honest. If our students aren't, they stole my jacket. <laughs> I get, well, it could be a testimony to your style. Oh, yeah, no. I, 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 I didn't say it. Yeah.